Timson Diagnostics, uh, name being slightly misleading, it's not really about diagnostics, it's about cancer monitoring, really. And essentially, we, we target three challenges within cancer care. One is the late detection of relapses. Usually, they are detected way too late to be able to administer the right sort of treatment, so it's important to, as early as possible, to detect a relapse. When a relapse has been detected, there is some sort of uh, treatment regimen, and then it's important to understand as soon as possible whether that has any effect or not. And if not, then you need to change that treatment. So fast results are important. After the initial treatment, there is usually, in the case of solid tumors, there is a surgical intervention. And again, it's important to understand, did we actually manage to remove the entire tumor, or is there something left that we need to take care of? And we will address all of these three things with basically a simple blood sample. And we look for something called ctDNA, circulating tumor DNA. Essentially, all cells in the body die, and when they do so, they will emit certain small gene fragments into the bloodstream. And when a tumor cell dies, it's called circulating tumor DNA. And these fragments, they, they dissolve within a matter of hours, meaning it's a live biomarker. So if you find ctDNA in the blood, there is a tumor present right now. It is used not to screen for cancer. It's used when you have a diagnosis, the cancer is there then we can take a portion of the biopsy and we can develop a panel which we then use for the blood samples. And we will check for the initial neoadjuvant therapy, whether it has any effect. We will check after the surgical intervention, whether the cancer has been removed or not. And then we will monitor the patients for however long it takes. Um, at Solgrenska Hospital in, in Gothenburg, we. Our technology is used to monitor children, pediatric patients with sarcoma. They've done that now for many, many years. And there will be very early indications of relapses when you use ctDNA, up to a year before standard of care methods like imaging. And only a couple of weeks ago, we learned that one patient, unfortunately, um, had increased level of ctDNA. But hopefully, it was so early that a treatment will be successful. We don't know yet, obviously. There are, there's been a number of ways to detect ctDNA. I mean, you can look at... A cancer, essentially, is a combination of various mutations, right? And you can look for one of those mutations using qPCR, and hopefully that mutation will be present because every cancer, every tumor is individual. It's not two breast cancer patients don't have exactly the same set of mutations. So the next way would be to have then the fixed panels, which has a larger number of mutations, but they are determined based on the most common mutations in a prostate cancer, a lung cancer, or whatever. And it may be that your specific cancer has two or three of those most common mutations, or none, or, or a whole lot. And you never know, really. What we do, again, is that we take a sample of the original biopsy, we develop a personal panel, which then will look for exactly those mutations that each individual patient has. So the following blood samples will check if there is ctDNA in blood using 20, 30, or up to 50 different markers. And we can also add clinically actionable markers like resistance markers to that same analysis. So if there is ctDNA in the blood, we will find it. The sensitivity is down to 0.001% and specificity obviously being rocket high, really. Today, we focus mainly on uh, clinical trials. So pharma companies with oncology trials where we help them assess the treatment efficacy. And we can also help with patient stratification, meaning the, so to speak, qualification of patients to be included in the trials. So if they have high amount of ctDNA in the blood, it's more likely that uh, they should be included in the trial. And there's been papers around that where they had, uh, I think, eight or 900 patients in a trial. And then after ctDNA qualification, it went down to 
90 or so, which of course lowered the total cost of that trial with about 75%. So we're looking at clinical trials today. We're also looking at validating our technology for preclinical trials. Uh, usually we get blood volumes of about 10 milliliters per patient in a normal clinical trial. We can't take 10 milliliters of a mouse. Uh, then it's going to be one test. That's it. So the validation right now looks at using our technology for much smaller blood volumes. So far it looks very, very good. Also in clinics, uh, again, assess the efficacy of the various treatments and follow patients, monitor them for relapses. Uh, we actually have now, since this summer, we signed on Docrates, which you may have heard of, a Finnish cancer clinic. So they switched from another company called Natera to us because of our versatility and our technology and our ability to meet their needs better. Uh, so they're now tracking their patients uh, with the use of uh, our services. Someone said in the first panel discussion it was all about differentiation. Uh, so I thought about that and said, well, okay, so I'm not going to go through everything on this slide. Uh, it's more like there are two parameters to differentiation for Simpson, as I see it. And one thing is what every single company says. It's about the customer experience. They all say it, but it ends up with a poster on the wall. We pledge really to provide the best possible customer experience. It's in the first call, it's when sending the invoice, making every report intuitive, making it really easy to do business with us. The other part is about the versatility of the technology. And we're actually the only company that we know of at least that can add various actionable biomarkers to the same analysis, like resistance markers, for example, which will be very interesting for anyone looking to assess whether it should be this chemo or that chemo, then resistance markers will be very interesting. We can use a tumor biopsy when developing the personal panel, or if it's already been sequenced, we can use that sequencing information. No worries, we can do that too. So there, there's a lot of versatility. Um, it's also a very good fit with existing clinical workflows. So we're having a discussion with a hospital in Southern Europe. They, want to, they don't want to allow us to do everything. Normally, European hospitals don't want to. They want to include the know-how and the technology in their own labs. So we said, Let's, we can develop the personal panel, and they can do the blood analysis, the ctDNA analysis. If they have access to sequencing, no worries. It fits perfectly into the existing workflows. The only thing they'd need would be our bioinformatics software, and we can provide that as software as a service to them. We have a number of customers, um, like uh, the region Västergötaland, that's actually a number of various researchers, um, Valo, uh, NeoGap. Theradex is not actually a customer per se, it's a CRO, and we're in the final qualification process with them right now, so come early next year, we'll have a deal with them and they're going to use our services as a product in their portfolio, so to speak, and it's going to be passed through costs, which is really interesting because they're not adding a margin, so we can invoice them as much as if we were to invoice the end customer directly. Geographically, we're in the Nordics. Uh, we want to expand first to the UK, uh, simply because biopharmas are clustered there around Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester and London, so it's easy to access them in, in one physical place, or in this case, four physical places. For the same reason, we're going to the Zurich and uh, Munich area after that, also a very nice cluster of biopharmas when we will go for clinical trials. Simultaneously, we'll go for private clinics in Switzerland, and next step going more westward into the French-speaking part of Switzerland with the uh, Lausanne-Geneva area, possibly parts of France, and then we're thinking about the US. We haven't made any decisions. If we go there, it's most likely not going to be in clinics. It's going to be with biopharmas. Um, I simply don't want to go there with clinics yet because of the risk exposure, which I'm not really comfortable with right now. So let's stick with biopharmas. Then we need to put up a lab. We can do that in a shared lab space in Boston, put three people in a lab and uh, one salesperson working the, the Golden Research Triangle, covering basically 70% of the US oncology biopharma market. 
Uh, we had real sales, I mean, no soft funding, uh, about less than a million last year, coming in more than that this year, and looking at some 250 million in revenues by 2030. I think that's a bit of sandbagging, really, uh, simply because looking at the market potential and the serviceable, obtainable market in Europe alone is about 4 billion euros, so 40 billion sec compared to the 250 million we're looking at by 2030. So hopefully it'll be more than that. If there are any investors still here, you'll be very pleased to know that we're currently raising money. And those money will be used for basically two things. One is for the international expansion. When we get more money in, we can go in parallel instead of just sequentially. And the other part is to get a CE mark so we can go broadly to clinics also in public care. So today we're going to private care. They're using our technology as, or our services as research use only. Uh, with a CM mark in place, we obviously can go to the public care as well. But I'm not building the company on that CM mark. We're growing through research customers and biopharma customers. And we're looking to raise about 40 million sec um, with a pre-money valuation of 65. We have had one previous round where we brought in 10 million ending in a post-money valuation of 50 million sec. And it says here we're about to close uh, end of this year. I think it's more realistic to speak about end of February. So I can provide the account details afterwards. Just get hold of me and I'll be here tomorrow as well. Thank you so much. And if you want to get hold of me, please do so or find me on LinkedIn if you can't find me here. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We have time for a few questions. Ouch. Yep. You'll not get out of this one. Given your detailed launch plan, could you be more concrete on how you will ensure optimal market uptake? Well, again, we want to go where it makes sense that we don't have to spread out to... I mean, we're six people today, so we can't afford to be everywhere. That's why we have today the sequential approach and go into the clusters. So essentially, we, we really want to go to Oxford and Cambridge and Manchester to put up breakfast seminars on site, having people there. We shouldn't speak about us. We're going to have uh, clinicians, we're going to have customers speak about us and about CTDNA analysis and the way we do it. And then going on to the next uh, cluster in, in Zurich and uh, Munich doing the same thing. I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers your question. I don't know either, but hopefully. How large portion of revenue should one expect partners to grab? Partners? Which partners? Yeah. I'm thinking so. This is the hard thing of uh, yeah. getting questions from the audience that you're not really. So, no partners no, so I mean, I mean, No, I mean, we're, today um, we don't have any specific partners yet, apart from, I mean, if you look at the CROs, which we consider to be partners, but they don't grab our revenue. They take it as pass-through cost, as I said. Um, however, if I look at this, uh, the split between, um, say, clinics and uh, biopharma, uh, we're going from 85% uh, biopharma, and hopefully it will be like 60% clinic, 40% biopharma come 2030. So that's something we're looking. I don't, again, understand if that really answers the question. Now I will give you an answer or a right. question that I do. Uh, understand and I'm really curious to know about. So if you take your technology, could it be used as a tool to detect cancer on a larger scale, like within a healthcare system, let's say a scanning <coughs> system per se? No, I don't think so. I mean, today it doesn't make sense simply because of costs alone. I mean, we could we could use it to, to scan, as you say, a whole bunch of people. It doesn't make sense. It's too costly. So we don't want to do that. However, interestingly enough, there are applications outside of healthcare. Um, we've had a lot of discussions and work ongoing with the National Forensic Center. And they want to be able to ascertain that a specific individual has been at a serious crime scene uh, more. We're very good at finding the small things in DNA. And what we can do now is that we can help them putting together a panel that makes it so much easier for them to, uh, to come up with the, the evidence they need that a certain individual was there. The interesting thing about that, however, is also that we're moving outside of the 
the regulated area when it comes to diagnostics and into a space where this panel, if the NFC, the Swedish police, buys it, then it's available to be purchased by the, the FBI or any country in the world, basically. So interesting. We went from healthcare system to juridical system. I know, but system. Just, it, it's a side business, but it could be like a, a cash cow, sort of. But uh, let's see when we get there. Let's see. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.